Now, we've got a bit of a, a teaching plan in place. We, um, I, saw a couple of, um, I saw a couple of comments. I may have missed them now. One of our uh, Heart Dog supporters. Now, our Heart Dog supporters are names in green. Um, it's easy for us to see their comments, but one of our Heart Dog supporters mentioned that. Let's see here. Uh, Catherine, how do I get uh, my new puppy to stop from biting and tormenting our older dog uh, and biting at him? Something that we can talk about a little bit. It's gonna uh, it speaks to your management more than anything else, but we can get back to that. So we like to take care of our heart dog supporters. Um, and Sue K dropping the five alive uh, emoji. <laughs> Cutie. Let's talk a little bit about. Let's start with counters because I think it's a good foundation. Like it's a good place to begin understanding. Um, you know, really understanding the process for teaching uh, to your dog to stop jumping up. And you'll be amazed at how a lot of these skills that we're going to begin speaking about transfer over to like when it gets more difficult, when you're on, you know, out for a walk or, you know, all of these surprise situations. Um, let's talk a little bit about, uh, let, let me know this. What do you do when your dog jumps up on someone or something? What's the first thing you do? Very first thing, drop it in the chat. I'd like to know. First step. It's going to inform me about how we're going to shape this conversation because it's really quite important. And um, you might be making a common mistake that a lot of new dog owners make as they struggle through this process. But let me know. What do you do? You're, you're walking along or maybe, you know, your, your neighbor comes up, says, Heidi ho, neighbor, you know, ooh, you have a puppy there. And your dog jumps up on them. What do you do? I'm interested to find out. I would say... There's one thing that I think Elizabeth, about panic. Panic, yeah, sure. There's one thing that uh, there's one thing that I think a lot of people do that's really confusing for their dog, and um, I already see it in the chat. Yeah, really common, and you know, yep. a, a couple of these uh, a couple of uh, these tips could change a big part of your training. Just understanding, you know, what what you do next. Okay, so I see a few people. Now, here's, let's talk about what we do. Yeah. What, what, what word we use uh, even before the actions we take. Yeah, so really what we want to try and do is be really good at predicting when a situation, um, we're in a situation where our puppy or our dog, do not care about the age, um, may be prone to, to jumping. And what we would use is the command off in that scenario. And for us, the word off um, doesn't necessarily mean get off. It means don't get up in the first place. Don't jump in the first place. So we prefer to use off as a, um, the only word I could think of is warning, but I don't know if I mean that, but basically a pre-cue to say, I know what you're thinking. I see that you're excited. Don't even think about it. Yeah. So I tell the dog off before they have a chance to jump. And then, of course, we need to train them what off means and how to respond to it. But that way we can actually prevent the jumping from the first place. And we'll, I don't know if we want, we want to talk about that now, whether we're going to get into the timing of yeah. why doing it beforehand okay. is so essential. Uh, it's, um, let's talk because you guys, I mean, this may be your first training experience with us at all, but clarity is the most important thing you can give your Timing. dog. Do dogs are so, um, you know, they're so black and white that very clear information is really, really important. So a lot of people I saw in the chat were saying down. Now, that might make sense or to get you. Get down. Or, yeah. yeah, get down. Down. Um, yeah. That might make sense to you. But we want our dogs to know exactly what we mean as we teach them and they, you know, as they, they build those foundations and start to get better and better at skills. We use down for a very specific thing, and that means lie down. Yeah. So we wouldn't use the word down in that situation because it's not exactly what I want from my dog. Off means get off the couch, get off the person, don't even think about jumping up. It's you know, the opposite of that uh, thing that they want to do. Um, we'll, we'll talk in a moment just about timing, but it's really important that you assign a word, and off is a great one because it pre comes pretty naturally to most people, to use in that situation. Now, let's talk about predicting let's get back to counter surfing and um, how jumping on the counter can actually be predicted in a lot of cases you know what are you looking for uh, when we have a new dog in the house that you think they're about to jump yeah so to back up a little bit um, you know when we 
why this is important to train because sometimes what people will do is they will like puppy proof their house and they'll try to make sure they put everything away that the dog might want to get up and um and steal or to get and i think when you have a young dog that's a super helpful thing to do but we also don't need you to like put everything like on top of the fridge where your dog can't get it yeah uh for a yeah. long time so that's that's really important to say um I totally forgot what you asked me. Sorry. Uh, what, like, what are some indications your dog's about to okay, jump? Okay, sorry. Yes. My allergies are bugging to me today, so it sounds like I'm underwater, and I'm a bit forgetful. It's because I've taken allergy medication. <laughs> also, and, uh, <laughs> she swam to the train station. Yeah, I'm not. Anyways, I'm trying to just not blow my nose. But anyways, the information's in there. I just got to get <laughs> it out. Um, anyways, so yeah, there's a, a couple obvious signs that your dog may be thinking about counter-serving. Um, one would be air scenting. And sure, that's probably a pretty obvious one to most. They air scent and they try to think about, you know, ooh, something smells pretty good up there. I want to go take a look. Yeah. And that's the point where I would start communicating with my dog that I don't want them to jump so again I'm not angry at them at that point because they haven't made any mistakes I'm just going to say off and just let them know ahead of time I see what you're thinking don't do it um but the other cue that is less recognizable is dogs will actually start to like coil down when they're about to jump up and you want to again try to catch them before they actually do the act of jumping because that is where we get into the self-rewarding part of things. So um, it's really important that also you're watching your dog closely because you're not able to see the signs of air scenting or right. them like bending down. It's like a bungee cord. They bend down just before they jump up. Um, Wendy says you're her dog barks, whatever the situation might be, you're not going to be able to see any of their cues if you're not actually watching them. So if you are having a problem with counter surfing at this time or jumping in general, that sort of tells you that at this point in time, not forever, but this point, they're not ready to be left on their own because they don't know the rules of the house yet. And when they're left to their own devices and no one's there to tell them not to do it, you better believe they're going to get up and reward themselves. So we want to be very careful that we're not getting too far ahead of ourselves before we feel really confident in our dog's decision making so that we can trust them and, and leave the room and, and know that they know the rules. But sometimes that takes um, a little bit of practice. 100%. And you're the most likely to be successful if you give your dog that information before they've committed the crime. Now, one of the things that's so important to understand is a lot of dogs are like super um, satisfied. Uh, you want to pull that one up? Uh, well, Su super satisfied by the act of jumping up on the counter yeah. or maybe even better for them, the act of jumping up on the person. It's not the reward is the act. So if you can interrupt the behavior and give them the information early, you're like way more likely to be successful. And we talked a little bit about like standing stock still or play, you know, that bow before as they coil to spring up. If you start to identify that in the house, uh, you know, in your kitchen, maybe as your dog goes to counter surf, jump up, give them the information. You're way more likely to start to be able to pick up on it when you're out on a walk. I mean, there's some pretty clear signals that your dog is about to jump up on someone. So if you can uh, interrupt that thought, interrupt that behavior uh, before they jump, you're l more likely to not have your dog un realize how much fun it is to jump mm -hmm. like start early really get on their case before they jump up you're way more likely to because um, it's so self it's so rewarding for your dog just to be up in someone's face and up you know jumping up it's real even if the person's like whoa you know sometimes that's enough it's exciting yeah it's very exciting um so back to the counter surfing you know we need to be able to watch our dogs so that we can um we can stop them from doing uh, those things and we've said to use the word off but just saying the word off to your dog doesn't stop the problem you actually need to train your dog yeah, what the absolutely. word off means sure. um, and that's really important and the reason why I say this is a lot of times people will use their voice and they will say off and then the dog will keep jumping up and then they get angry totally. off off totally well you know, it's like, imagine you going to a different country and somebody says something to you in a language that you don't understand and you think, well, I don't know what that means. So you keep repeating the same thing you're doing and then they keep yelling at you, large, you know, louder and louder and you think, I don't know what that means and you seem very angry right now. The dogs are exactly the same thing. They don't understand commands until we teach them what they mean. So yeah. um, 
If your dog is loose in the kitchen with you um, or wherever they happen to be jumping up, the kitchen's usually the most common place that, that dogs will jump up, it's really important to have a leash or a line attached to your dog's collar in the house. Yep. And this suggestion is really surprising to a lot of people because people envision a leash only being used when you take your dog for a walk and some people don't even believe in that. Um, but we suggest in the process of training, in the training um journey with your dog you actually have a leash on in in the house with yeah. your dog and we call these house lines yep. they differ a little bit from our leash they're not like our nice beautiful training leather leashes they're sort of a a lighter weight leash that we uh, cut the handle off so it slips and slides around the furniture safely um, it's to be used with supervision so you don't just put it on and walk away you put it on and this allows you to get control of your puppy or your dog quickly and effectively without actually having to physically go after their body totally. and this is really important because we want to be able to be clear with our expectations but we don't want to be scaring the dog we don't want to be uh, Ken just mentioned if you reach down and try and grab them a lot of smart dogs will deke out of the way and then yep. it becomes a bit of a catch it's me a game. Ten game yeah. yeah and then the dog <laughs> says well that was fun i'm gonna jump up on the counter and get him to try and chase me again and we don't want to play games with the dog we want to just you know get our point across very clearly without having to raise our voice so by having the leash on i can step on the leash and stop the dog from from jumping up on the counter if i'm nice and close i could say off and i could use the leash to prevent the dog by redirecting the dog back to the floor and then give my dog something else to do but um you know in our training methodologies we uh cover the same three steps in almost every single thing that we train Q stimulus reward this yeah. is getting a bit dog training this is good for though you. this is good because if you're really paying attention and you're really having difficulty you have to break it down this is a perfect example of yeah. breaking it down so that all the steps start to make sense so the Q would be the word off you would be telling the dog off the stimulus would be something that you do that that changes the behavior it could be um stopping them with the leash it could be um luring them into a sit instead it could be something that you physically do to help the dog go into position that is not jumping so prevention and then reward well that's obvious reward well maybe it's not obvious reward people think oh give the dog a treat right. you don't have to give the dog a treat you just have to give them positive feedback so that they now know what they're doing is correct and that might just be like a good girl or a good boy um or it could be go and get your bone something that gets the dog doing something else that's positive so mm -hmm. the dog goes oh okay when i jump up on the counter that's not much fun you take the leash and you make me get off but then when i go and lie down on my bed and chew my bone you seem awfully happy about that so maybe that's a better choice for me um so the q stimulus reward is is really really important now i wanted to mention as i'm seeing the chat go through here there's a few people that are mentioning things like oh i just ignore my dog okay i was gonna grab those yeah let's talk about bad advice yeah um so, or um yeah there's there's quite a few suggestions that are, yeah. are coming through the chat which is a great discussion oh, but i want to that's why we them. have these things for I sure debunk so, them ignoring for you. your dog uh turning your back to your dog yeah. but i want to talk about why specifically that is not a good idea yep. because um we're not following good timing by doing that and what we're talking about now is a behavior that is extremely self-rewarding so if your dog jumps up on the counter and you're going to stand there and ignore them and wait for them to decide to, to jump back down your dog does not give two hoots about whether you are paying attention to them or whether they are whether you're not at that point they don't They're, give two toots no two toots there you go their mind is on what crumbs can i lick off the counter you know what what turkey can I steal off the thing? And right. ignoring them in that situation just allows them to rehearse self-rewarding behaviors. And that's why things like jumping, barking, pulling, some of these behaviors that are, are really internally enjoyable for the dogs to do, ignoring those behaviors do not work. Um, it, it's much clearer and, and it has poor timing. You're allowing the dog to rehearse a poor behavior for a long time before you're addressing it. If you do something the moment they make that bad choice and you stop it from happening and then you quickly redirect to, uh, direct them to something that they should be doing you are going to fix your process um a, a lot quicker um and in saying that it's also a leadership moment 
Like yeah. It's a great opportunity to give your dog information. They start to understand that like, oh, you're going to tell me, uh, you know, whatever your expectation is. You're going to, you know, uh, I'll be looking to you for some sort of cue that you're going to get, you know, you're going to tell me what you want me to do. Those are really valuable moments. You can't do this. You can do this. Yeah. Great opportunities for training. Now, uh, two, two more. I'm going to cover this one first. Two more. They're, they're similar. Do you believe in kneeing uh, them when your dog jumps on you? No. This can be especially Absolutely. challenging. Absolutely not. This could be especially challenging for rough and tumble breeds. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because that's fun for them. And all of a sudden, it is a blast to jump up on you. And it's a big game. It's, you know, a bit like being in the litter. You rough and tumble hurt, thing. hurt your dog by doing sure. that as well. We're not, we're not interested in doing that. The other one we often hear is, uh, oh, well, just grab their paws and hold them there. Or grab their paws, paws and awful. squeeze them. Yeah. It's really important that you guys aren't making choices like that. And think about this. So let's say you do it once and it works and your dog's like, oh man, I really don't want to jump up. What happens the next time you have to go take a paw? What happens the next time you mm -hmm. have to go clip their nails? What happens the next time they step on a thorn? Yeah. Actually, you have a good um, story from one of your dogs swimming. Um, it's not important right now. It, but it's comparable. So if yeah. you have to handle your dog, you don't want them to be worried about you taking their paws. I've also heard of people saying that they just like attach a bunch of like pots and pans together or something. And then when the dog jumps up... Um, that like rattles and falls on top of them or spraying them with a water bottle. I've heard that as well. And again, all of these things, yeah, they, they might fix your problem, but there are much less vain ways to go about correcting your, your dog for doing such things. And also too, like try having, taking, you know, your dog cr could create sound sensitivity. Your dog could, um, you know, not want to get a bath anymore. So we want you to just Give them good information. Simply, we're not getting mad. We're not making it a big deal. We're just giving them the facts. Right. Um, I wanted to talk about why um, why the timing is is so popular, and it goes back to my very first point, and that is when we use the word off, we are intending to use it before the dog actually jumps up. So it's not get off of there. Does that happen sometimes? Of course, because dogs are, are, are dogs and sometimes, you know, we're not perfect. But the goal, generally speaking, is we have great supervision. And when the dog goes to make the error, we can use off preemptively. Yeah. Now, the reason why this is so important is that we need to have good timing. I mentioned before, you know, sometimes people will say, well, I take the leash and I get him off, but he just keeps jumping up and I don't understand. I'm doing everything that you say I'm doing. And then we watch them do it or they send us a video and there's always the same error. And that is the person is missing the pre-cues. When I watch the video, I see the dog air sniff. I see the dog's thought process go, I'm going to jump up on the counter. And then I see the dog jump up. And then I see the dog go to, to, to steal something. And then the person saying off and they get off. Well, the crime's already committed at that point. Yes, you might've gotten the dog off, but the dog said, Ooh, that was really fun. I got, at, I got up to get there and I saw, saw what was up there. I could see, you know, smell what was up there. These are all you know, rewarding behaviors for the dog. So if you're trying to do this and you're not affecting change, the very first thing that you should look at is your timing. Are you, are, is your uh, redirection or your correction coming always after the dog has been jumping right. on that thing? Or are you being fast enough that you're actually getting that redirection in there before they complete the jump? And if you're doing that, you will fix your jumping. If you're missing that, that's going to be a game changer for you. Sue K. Okay, I think I'd like to get, Sue K says, you mentioned uh, calling the dog before jumping. Can you explain how that looks different from the dog preparing to sit? When a dog is preparing to sit, their weight will be in their back end. When a dog is going to coil, their weight will be in their front end. So let's talk, this is a good point. We, we can get back to the, like, the structure and the, the steps for um, jumping up on counters, counter surfing mm -hmm. in a minute. I think we've really, I think you have a clear idea now of like that dogs can find jumping rewarding that, that does need to be like a massive payout for them. So I think this is an important opportunity for us to talk about a training, something we call the training target, the dog training target. It's a really good way for this skill especially to think about how you can stop good jumping mark. up, how you can reinforce the good stuff in uh, in your training uh, that, that's going to help you. It's going to speed things up for you. So I'm going to give you this. And we're going to go and we're going to watch a video from, I think it's when we had the Euchre series with uh, Little Puppy Euchre. And she loved jumping up um, on uh, wild, long-haired, crazy uh 
passers-by. So we had to work on this exercise with her. But this, I want you to think about this as the foundation of your jumping up on people training. Uh, so let's go, let's cut right to that. I want to introduce to you the concept of a training target so you know what a target looks like. I want you to think about those different areas as different thresholds that you can use with your dog to make things either easier or more challenging as your dog's training progresses. So if you look at the biggest um, circle on a target, it's the, usually the easiest one to achieve, it's going to be the same thing with your dog training. If you're working with your dog around other people, think about having those people stay in the biggest area of the target the furthest away from your dog uh, in order for your puppy to be successful. Now, if they're at a distance and your dog is able to sit on a loose leash, they're able to check in with you, they're able to be attentive, you can then have that person close into the middle part of that target. They can come in a little bit closer. And this is where, really where you're going to need to work your butt off. Now, now, what are you seeing here? You know, as as you're training this at home, maybe your neighbor, friend, uh, whatever, uh, someone you've paid on uh, Fiverr to come over and, and be your <laughs> training buddy, um, maybe they're not getting that close. That's not the point. It's not the point. The point is that the training target expands and decreases in size depending on your dog's success. Mm -hmm. So that green zone may be much closer that your dog wouldn't jump on somebody. But it sounds like for a lot of you who are here tonight, that green zone is a lot farther away. The red zone is much larger. So if anyone gets close enough, your dog is definitely going to jump on them. The yellow zone is the section where you're not sure, like this is the working area for you right now. Your dog might remain in a sit, uh, or they might jump on somebody. It's really important that you've worked on this sit at your side as an independent skill in a completely boring environment. You know, people are often say like, well, okay, well, you know, I can sure I can do it in my living room, but then as soon as I take a step outside, it falls apart. That's, it's re it is important to get a foundation and teach your dog that there is a reason to sit at my side. And then as you take uh, it farther and farther, your show on the road, so to speak, you're able to get success along the way. So maybe your front steps, maybe it's uh, out to the elevator, maybe it's wherever that your dog can be successful, but reinforce that sit at your side before trying to tackle a challenging skill like jumping up. Once you're at the point where your dog gets it, they, they understand that, okay, if I sit at your side, there's value in it. You know, I'm guaranteed to get a reward if I keep my butt down here, but there's a chance that I could get something engaging from this person approaching. They need to know there's value for sure for remaining in at your side. Now, let's move on. Kelsey. I just want to say one thing. Yeah. Uh, Carrie had asked, how do we train them to know off? So, Carrie, watch very carefully yeah. because we are in this whole next section of the live stream. We are going to be starting to condition the dog to understand what the word off is. And the word off is going to go along perfectly with the sit because we're going to be teaching that instead. So as Euchers, I know um, you can, I'm talking to camera and I'm talking to the dog at the same time, but um, what I'm cueing the dog to do here is I'm using the word sit, which she knows very well. And I'm also throwing the word off in there. So yeah. as uh, Ken gets, I mean, that's not Ken, uh, as that crazy haired person gets a little closer, I am saying to her off, good off, good sit, good off, and I'm yes and rewarding her. So she's starting to understand that off means sit, be calm, get rewarded, focus on me, check the person out, but learn to stay in position. So this is how we build value for the word off so that when we use it in that counter surfing situation or whatever it might be, the dogs had experience with this uh, behavior. So this is the all that we're showing you answers your question perfectly. Other, I mean, maybe I should grow my hair out. I mean, right now, I feel like I look like the guy from Scooby Doo. You know, the guy that drove the van around? Uh, like yep, my hair I would agree like, with that. Looks like a hair mitt. I would agree with that. It doesn't all need to be perfect. It's okay if somebody starts to get close and your dog makes an error, but what you do about that error is gonna make all of the difference. Let's talk first steps. So you're out for a walk with your dog. Your dog happens to see somebody at a distance. You can kind of tell they're gonna come in to wanna say hello to your dog. What's the first thing that you should do? Well, the first thing you need to do is get your dog's attention before they get locked on to that distraction. So I might interrupt her, I might use a bit of food. Hey pup, what's this? 
hey, hi, what's this? And I might lure her into my side and go to a control exercise that she's been working on. So she understands that when she's sitting at my side, yes, that she needs to remain in that position even though there's distractions around. And this is an obedience skill that we drill into them and that when they're young to help teach emotional control. So my dog's in the control position and as that person approaches, I'm just gonna say, hey, how's it going? Just hold on, wait there one second. I'm just gonna instruct them to just sort of stop at a distance. Good girl, okay, come a little closer. Yes, good. Now, um, an important part of this is when you have your friend, family member, whoever your helper is, that you're coaching them. You're coaching them as much as <laughs> you're coaching your dog. It's actually really, really important. Um, so many people say like, well, I can't stop someone from coming Somebody's up. Somebody's just gonna walk in. Yeah, and, and what do we say to that? What would we say? Well, you have two choices. You're either not gonna be in that scenario in the first place until your dog's ready to combat that, or you're gonna ask that person very politely, hey, I'm actually working on teaching my puppy or my dog not to jump up right now. Do you want it? Would you mind helping me? Sometimes I'll even pass them a couple of my treats or my bait bag. Um, and then I'll have them reward the dog in the sit if they're ready for that, or I'll just reward. But I take the bull by the horns and I control that situation. And if I feel like I'm in a, a spot where my, my dog's gonna be rushed or it's gonna be really, really hard for them to hold that sit because there's too much going on, I'm not gonna put my, my dog in that scenario until they're ready. It's not um, like we avoid everything forever. We just do it when it's smart to do it. Here's the good news is that if somebody likes dogs, obviously they do because they're approaching you and they want to meet your dog. They'll, they're going to be excited about the idea that they're going to help you train your dog. If they don't like dogs, they're probably not coming up to you. So it's not a concern at all. Mm -hmm. So I, I love that approach, that strategy. Girl, good sit. Yes. And my focus is going to be more on the dog and less on the person. Now, if I see that she's, oops, if she's over distracted and she can't hold that sit, I'm just going to ditch the food and I'm just <laughs> You're like melting. Sit, good girly. I'm going to place her back into that sitting position. And once she's on a loose leash, there's my Papa Rooney. I'm going to yes and reward once again. Papa okay, Rooney. come in. Now, placing your dog back in position. There's some people that um, hesitate to do this. One of the, often, one of the skills that quickly falls apart for new dog owners is like, well, what do I do if my dog gets up? I mean, I've got treats in my hand. Put your food away, place your dog back in position. Again, this gets back to the clarity thing. You know, and you leadership. And leadership, 100%. Listen, buddy, I ask you to remain at my side. Look at how quickly Euchre goes back in that position because she's been reinforced for being there. But also, Kale was very clear about this. Like, oh, nope, you got to sit right there. Having this, this kind of information for your dog reinforces the fact that they're not allowed to just break position. They're, they're not allowed to go jump on that other person. They're actually not even supposed to stand up. Yeah. The expectation is they sit, uh, uh, you know, on the ground beside you and they'll be rewarded when they make those choices. You have to make it worth it for them. It's also really important to remember that, you know, as you can see, we like to use food in our training, but we're not using it as a bribe or a lure here. Yeah, so good. if yeah. uh, lure, um, lure, what's her name? <laughs> Euchre uh, was to go and jump on Ken and I was to pull treats out and lure her back and then reward her. And then two seconds later, she went to go and jump on Ken and I got the treats out and I lured her back. Uh, I, food motivated or a smart dog might go, oh, this is awesome. I get up, I get to see that person and then mom whips out treats and she right. lures me back. Right. And now I start a, start a, a bit of a vicious circle. So um, you'll notice that when Euchre gets up, I actually put the food away and I place her back beside me as her correction. It's not very corrective, but it's just to say, hey, I don't want you to do this, but I do want you to do this. Once she's at my side, the most important step, and I don't know whether I, I hope I speak to this, but one thing I want you to notice by looking at the screen there is look at my leash. It's completely. Oh, what happened to your hand? There. Yeah. Uh, it's completely loose because yeah. I want to put the onus back on Euchre to make a choice. I'm not going to hold her on a tight leash and force her to sit beside me. Right. I'm going to place her back. I'm going to put Slack back in the leash and I'm going to let her decide. If she chooses to maintain the sit, then of course I'm going to reward her, which is what she did there because we've been working on this. But a lot of normal puppies, you'll place them back and they're so excited about what's in front of them and they just get up from the sit and go again. And people get frustrated too quickly, but you just need to stay calm and keep 
keep repeating that placement or move back further away from that person. Get that person cl out of the close target and send them back out to the yellow zone. Make it a little bit easier for your dog to be successful, but it's very important that when you're working the off command, you're working jumping, that your leash goes back to that neutral loose position so that your dog can learn to do this independently. If you're just holding your dog's leash tight, if you're just shoving treats in your dog's face, they're not learning to do this independently. Yeah, absolutely. And this is something that you'll become dependent on food forever or your dog will never truly understand. They yeah. have to choose. You have to give them the chance to choose and you set them up knowing that they can be successful with the things that we've talked about already. And try again, sit, yes. Now, if she's able to hold the sit as that person gets close, I can then say, all right, you can pet her. Good girl, oops. Oopsie. So, so I want her again. to maintain that sit, even though she's being padded. So she gets up. The opportunity to be padded sort of is is non not on the table anymore. Again, you're again? coaching. You yes, know, good girl. Now, yes. Did you, see, did you see that? Did you see the timing of Kel's reward? So I bent I'm over. Sneaky. I it's mean, smart. Kent bent over to pet Euchre at that point, and that's exactly the same time that Kale had tr like rewarded Euchre. Almost the same time. So she didn't have that same opportunity to jump up. Now watch how she, she starts to change that timing so that Euchre's now choosing more and more to remain in position. Good girl. Yes, now the next thing that I can do is I also could give her permission to go and say hello, but when I do that, I'm gonna keep my leash handy and I'm gonna instruct that person just to be calm. Now, another issue that we've had with Euchre is that if she's if starting to feel um, a little bit overexcited sometimes she'll Let's actually submissively pee and it's there. even worse if people are squeaking and squawking and bending over top of her so I'll often just encourage people to either stand up tall or bend down and, and sort of keep their body upright and then I'll let her go and say hello good okay good go say hi okay go say hi Buddy. off good girl okay. good now, do you see that off. do you see what yeah. just happened there so Euchre went in and she hit the hit the ground. She like sat down and then she looked back at Kale because she's just had a bunch of reinforcement for remaining in the sitting position. So her default was to move up towards Kent, uh, sit down and look back towards Kale. That's the kind of thing you want from your dog. Like, hey, is this good? Like, what do you think? You know, um, rather than completely blowing you off. Couldn't care less diving on the other person because they know they're going to get scratchies on their neck. Or I know um, a lot of people are saying, I need a helper. I need someone to help me with this. Yeah. If you can get someone to help you with this, this is really helpful. You can use family members um, and hope, you know, some dogs are more distracted by family members than they are strangers that they don't know. And some dogs are the um, opposite, but it is really helpful because you want to be practicing these exercises many times, lots of repetitions in situations when you're prepared to work through it what you don't want to do is wait for that random time somebody comes out of the blue and says oh can I, I pat your dog and you don't have your leash gathered up and you don't really have treats ready you're not ready to actually give your dog great information so you need to set aside time to devote to training this and um, it, it honestly it does not take very long for the dog if you have good timing and you have good information and you're rewarding properly um, it doesn't take long for the dogs to figure this out it's also crazy valuable to make sure that you're not making excuses for reasons not to train for uh you know reasons why you're struggling with leash walking for you know reasons why you uh are having potty training accidents in the house um it's 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 not uncommon to think like oh well you know i can't do uh, the training because of this reason like i can't find a helper anyone you meet on the street i would bet let's say at least 75% are going to be ecstatic about a a helping you, being asked to help you train your puppy. It's really, I mean, anyone who even likes dogs would be like, oh, this sounds like, yeah, I'd love to help. So um, it's really important. And I see it a lot in, um, especially on like YouTube videos and stuff, a lot of excuses. And I'll tell you, just, just working a little bit harder, like not allowing yourself to say like, oh, well, I mean, I guess I can't go for walks because it's so busy. You know, I, I live in the city. It's so busy around my house. Take an extra 30 and find somewhere that you can train that's a little quieter so your dog can be successful. Um, you know, uh, supervise people that often uh, uh, make excuses about potty training accidents, house mm -hmm. training accidents. Well, I mean, you know, uh, I didn't want him. He was in his crate for three hours today and uh, I, you know, whatever. I can't. I don't want him to be in there all the time. I agree. So uh, build out a schedule, like plan your day with your puppy so that 
you're supervising them, giving them exercise, doing lots with them, and they're so tired by the time they've had lots of fun with you that they want to go lie down in their crate. But it's really important that you're making a commitment to your dog. You owe it to them and you owe it to yourself. So, um, you know, I, I sort of doubled down on that. It, you know, it may not be the case for you at least, but um, I, it's something that's very common and I want you to just understand that that little bit of extra effort, boy, is it worth it. Because that's the choices. I, I made those excuses. I made those, you know, um, sacrifices in my training. And then I started training at McCann Dogs and uh, became like an avid student before I was a trainer. And I realized, man, what a shortcut it would have been if I had just like asked my neighbor to help me. Or what a shortcut yeah. it would have been if I just worked a little bit harder at it. It always surprises me. I have this mentality, I guess, because I'm a dog trainer and, and I know how it works. But, you know, you have your dog for, you know, 10, 12, 15, 16, 17 years. This and it so surprises true. me why people don't put more effort into the first two years of the dog's training yeah. because it then you can enjoy a completely different life with the dog if you just put a little bit of work oh. in in the early stages. Yeah. Like already, like I have, we our youngest is um, a year and a half older, youngest puppy. And like I already am kind of forgetting about some of the puppy stuff because you just do the work and we're already starting to reap the benefits of the training. So and listen, this, do it. <laughs> if you, if you don't know, I started at McCann dogs as a student. I, I'm not saying this as like a wag my finger. You're, you're, a, uh, you know, I'm a dog trainer thing. I was a student, so I get it. I made all the same wrong choices. That's why this YouTube, YouTube channel exists to help you with the problems I would have had. Okay, let's move on. Yes. So good girl. Yes. Now you don't necessarily have to food reward your dog in this moment. Yes. She took the food there, but she could really care less. What she really wants is love and affection. And as long as she's remaining in this sit position, I'm going to allow her to get that affection. But I also want to make sure that I have good control. So I also want to train her. Euchre. Yay, good girl. I want the ability to get her back uh, to me and when I want her to, but because she's a puppy, I'm gonna train her to do that. Shall we try that again? So by training okay, her to do that, hi. you see, I didn't call her and hope that she listened. I would just call her and expect she listened as an older dog. But as a puppy, I'm saying her name yes, and luring her with treats so she can't be wrong. Yes, Euchre. Yay! See, I don't give girl. her a chance to ignore so I let her go visit for me. Just I call a moment, her name and then I, and then I automatically lure her away. I don't give her the option of um, of making a poor choice. And when I do that over and over and over again, what will happen is I'll go to say euchre and I'll go to use the food to help her, and she like will whip back towards me before I can even do that because I've built so much value for coming to me. And then eventually, I don't need to use food at all. I just say euchre, and whoop, she whips right back to my right, side again. Right. But people test their dogs too early, and then when the dog ignores them, they start y saying the name again, or they start you know dragging them with the leash, and it's just such bad information. And when the ultimate goal is that the dog should listen to your voice. I don't want to have to have a leash attached to my dog at all times or to have a bait bag filled with food strapped to my body at all times. Right. I'm going to do those things in the early stages, but with good timing and good information, my goal is to eliminate those things and just have a dog that loves to listen because I've made it re rewarding for them. And Mark Levesque says, uh, I value treats are a necessity here. Yeah. And that may be the case. Really. If you have a dog that loves to People, jump up, yeah. this is where you're bringing out the good stuff, the stuff that they they will just go crazy for because you get more attention. You get uh, that sense for them of higher value reward when they make good choices. I let her go visit for a moment, then I call away, keeping it nice and short and sweet. The longer I let her hang out there, the more opportunity there is for her to make an error so I can get lots of little reps in without her making a lot of mistakes. Now, she was really good. She didn't jump on Ken. But I did have my leash ready, and if she did, what I would have done is instructed Ken to stop petting. And this is where a lot of, um, you know, maybe less experienced people around dogs have trouble because often you can. Okay. Oh, you're the cutest thing in the world. Good. Oh, so. See that. Ken's behavior is actually causing okay. Euchre to jump up on him right now. So it's very difficult. I'm just see, her be it's very there. difficult yeah. to yeah. teach her so what to do see. if I'm just allowing this to happen. And look, now she's starting to nip and bite at his uh, hand. Okay, she thinks this is, this is a game. This is good. So, do you have a dog like this? Like the moment they get to jump up, that's when you know the nipping and biting. We gave her an inch regresses. and she took a mile. Yeah, super common. You're not alone. You know, when you're when the dog gets sort of to this state of mind, it may makes it tougher to train because they're just like just over the moon excited about the opportunity to scratch and jump and 
nip and bite. It's just, it makes them, uh, it makes it harder to train them. So um, this is where that interrupting early is so valuable. Also giving them, uh, showing them what you want rather than just um, correcting what you don't want. That's why this is so important. So basically he's provoking her to, to make a poor choice. Oh, she says, I'm just going to be a wild animal now. So if I'm not giving her good information, you she's can see to how she's just pocket. making poor choices. Uh, but if toys I available McCandogs.store. <laughs> the situation she up so I'm in control time. it goes entirely different good <laughs> so um some important takeaways of that I mean we, we you you got an opportunity to see the training target I think it's really valuable it doesn't matter what skill you're working on that training target can apply but when it comes to um when it comes to working on this, jumping up on people, uh, always have control of your leash. Get your dog in a control position first and show them that it's valuable to remain there. Don't rush the process. Such a common thing is people are like, oh, okay, well, I mean, they're sitting, come on in. Little bits and pieces at a time. You don't want to overwhelm your dog too quickly because it's, this is a difficult skill, especially for those happy-go-lucky, wiggly-bum, friendly dogs. Absolutely. I'm getting caught up on the... So chat there. Maybe you need this. We've got, uh, let's talk about jumping on the couch. We'll go back to counters a little bit because then we can talk a little bit more about why, how the off get, gets, becomes more valuable or, or easier to understand. But maybe you need this kind of help throughout the week. You know, one night at the train station, uh, maybe that's not enough. Maybe you need personalized feedback for your, you and your dog. That's where our online training program, Life Skills, would be just right for you if you have a dog over four months. Let's talk a little bit about what life skills has to offer and why it might be valuable if you're at a point in your dog training where you're like, I can't stop them from jumping up on people. Yeah. So we have a, um, our life skills one program where we, we work a lot on all kinds of exercises, but of course we work on greeting manners within that exercise since that's the topic we're talking about tonight. Um, we have them in person at our training school in Flamborough, Ontario. But if you are um, too far to come to us in person, um, then you can train with us online. Um, obviously, but a lot of people are apprehensive to do online classes because they um, sort of don't think that they're going to get the same value as being in a classroom. And, um, you know, it took us a long time before we did online classes because we wanted to make sure that we had a program where our students felt really supported. They felt like we knew them and yeah. their dog and they weren't just like another profile name. Um, yeah. So we do offer a lot of support in our online programs. Um, we have instructors in our support groups six days a week. We have weekly uh, private Zoom calls where we get together as a group and we talk about different topics and they're so fun. Um, imagine you got to ask these yeah. questions. Like your questions are Zooming by in the chat. They're hard for us to capture. But imagine you got to ask those questions directly to Kale. Yeah. Like this is the sort of support you get. We, and it's funny when you talk about um, online training and how you know how much time we took to like deliver the right uh, training for, for online students yeah. but we train more than a hundred thousand dogs in our training facility you know, mm -hmm. there's, near, there's more than 500 dogs every single week and we know that you know there are some like nuances to the training that are hard to communicate online so we needed to figure out exactly how we could do that and how the back and forth would work mm -hmm. to make you successful so anyway check out uh mccandogs.com slash life skills for our life skills program and damn lots of links will probably drop and you also can call our office and speak yeah. to one of the instructors a, actual dog the trainer. trainers there and they can direct you in in the right direction so Another, a, it's a very common challenge people have with jumping up is dogs jumping on the couch. Now, I, I've well, never... Well, some people don't care about this and some people don't like this. So we right. should maybe talk about why it could be a problem. 100% or also why it can uh, contribute to uh, jumping up in general. Yeah. Um, see how he just threw it back to me there? It was very sly. Yeah. That's what I do. <laughs> just hear... Uh, anyway, it's happened. Um... So if we if we're having real issues with dogs jumping up, it can be in on people, on counters, wherever it might be. It can be a little easier to get through the storm by eliminating the dogs jumping up at, on anything in any situation um, for a while. Now, jumping up on the couch or getting up on the couch with you um, can be a personal decisions uh, a decision. Um, we will be transparent with you. Our dogs absolutely get on the couch with us they snuggle yeah. with us they watch movies they do all those things but here's the deal 
They don't just get to, when they're puppies and they're learning and they're learning to be respectful and they're learning all their rules, they don't just get to just jump up whatever they want to and have the corner seat and like we don't we don't tailor around them. We teach them about jumping up when we give them permission and also to get off when we ask as well. So we'll actually practice, you know, encouraging them to get up. I'll say, okay, hop up and they're allowed to get up. If I don't say that, I don't want them just assuming they can jump up there. Yeah. And then we also need to make sure that if I say off, boom, they get off. There's a leadership problem. If your dog's on the couch and right this second, you don't have the ability to say off you get and they don't get up immediately, there's some leadership things going on there. So um, it's important, Dan, I get the corner seat, just so you know. Um, It's important that the leadership is there. So in the early stages, you might not want to blur the waters with that. If you decide that the couch is something that you don't mind, I would work through making sure that there is some more rules about getting on and getting off it because your dog will have a better idea of of being respectful. And to do that, you need to have your leash on so you can control whether they're on or off, have some rewards so you can help them to learn the process, um, and then be strict about it. Make sure everyone in the family is also having the same consistency um, so that the dog can understand and we're not not creating confusion. This might be a tough ask for Dan, but... um we have a video where we show go lie in your bed and I think didn't we train it at home with one of the puppies where we were like we taught to go lie down on your bed and then we threw food to it or maybe it was slam anyway we have a video if you can give your dog a dog a job and while you're working on this now this is a training moment this is something you put your feet up and you watch Netflix or Apple TV or whatever you're going to be training throughout this process but you're still using your couch um it's very recently we had a puppy uh, at home and we were teaching them to not jump up anyway that's a valuable it's a listen everything is training everything for the first while um because your dog's learning whether you're in the act of training them or not, they're learning the good stuff, but they're also learning the bad stuff. So you need to make sure that you're really intentional about the training process. Again, with the Life Skills Program, it gives you an opportunity to know what that should look like. But but really like figuring out, okay, um, you know, I have some time after dinner. I want to go sit on the couch and watch TV, but we're having some nipping and biting problems. We're also having some leadership issues yeah. and struggling with jumping up. Why don't I use the, my first... 20 minutes or 15, who knows how long it's going to be. It doesn't need to be super long. I'll use the first 15 minutes. I can have the show running and we can do training. I can work on this exercise. And then puppy can go out for their pee, back in their kennel, and then I can sit down and watch TV. Your dog now has had some exercise for their body and their brain. They're way more likely to chill out in their crate. Yeah, and you know, what a what an evening of watching TV with a puppy looks like in our house is they're either have been well exercised, trained, they've got lots of attention and they're in their crate great while we sit back and relax and have a glass of wine and and decompress and not worry about the puppy or the puppy's out with us but in the early stages I'll sometimes pull the dog bed over and I'll actually put it right on the ground like right below the couch and I'll sit on the dog bed with my back against the couch I'll have a um, you know a bone and I'll encourage the puppy to be on the bed with me I'll let them chew the bone and I want them just to be calm and to lie because I want them to learn at this time of night we are not puppy burning around the house and causing havoc we are chilling out we're lying down we're chewing on the bone and I start to sort of implement that process and if the puppy will is able to do that great if they're a little bit too busy and I try to settle them and it's not working then I'll usually just go put them in their crate not angrily just okay no. I'm not going to argue with you about this no big deal in you go bye bye um, but typically the, because they're well exercised prior to doing that they do figure it out and then as the weeks and the months go on the dogs just sort of naturally learn like when we watch TV at night our dogs usually grow grab a bone and they lie on the bed or sometimes they go up on the blanket on the couch and they just chew their bone and they're just chilled and relaxed while we watch TV. But they're taught that from an early age that when this happens, this is what we want you guys to do. Yeah. And it's not even... It's not even that, um, it's not just that we want you to do that. It's what you ought to do with your dog yeah. to give them great information so that they learn faster. You're not frustrated and you're not struggling with your training. Um, I, I actually... Uh, looks like Katrina said, my dog likes, <laughs> decided he likes jumping at me at the age of one and a half. He's also 140 pounds and I'm struggling. Oh my gosh. I think Katrina, I think I 
tried to tag a gentle leader. Let's talk maybe about the value of a gentle leader and how it's like power steering for your dog training. Yeah, if you do have a dog that is a bit wild and crazy and you find that you do struggle with their power and their weight uh, when you're trying to use the the leash, sometimes using um, a head collar such as the gentle leader. And again, there's lots of head collars out there, but in our 40 years of experience, um, the gentle leader by far outweighs the competition in yeah. terms of how it's used, how it works, its quality, um, all of that stuff. So that's the product that we recommend. Um, and it's a really helpful tool because it has a really wonderful um, calming effect on the dog. Um, and it allows you to control the dog a little bit more easily. You can turn the head, just like you know, imagine trying to walk a horse with like a you know, a lasso, lasso, oh my God. Uh, like oh a my flat God. buckle collar yeah, around their head. I don't know why I just Or a lasso. <laughs> around their neck. I don't know. I, I'm you trying. Know, I, I almost went the whole stream without saying something stupid. So, of course... I have to do that. Yeah. Anyways, That's it's much the fun of the live stream because it's totally live. Uh, yeah. Anyways, um, you would rather have the the control on the head rather than on the neck because you 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 don't have to use as much power. You don't have to use as much strength to control the dog. And um, you know the general leader it helps with leadership because of where it sits on the pressure points. And one of the reasons we like it is it's very powerful, but it's completely pain free. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't hurt the dog. It it works on the premise of pressure rather than the premise of pain and um it, the feelings that they get are very recognizable to what you know the types of of um, pressure or discipline they would have got from their mom when they were puppies it's all familiar to them and it allows us to take control without having to get really angry and you know make it a scene we can just off turn the dog sit lift up it's like like he said power steering for dogs so mm -hmm. um that could be a helpful tool for some of you out there with the big strong dogs and honestly I, your dog's a year and a half old uh they're 140 pounds that's a long time to be rehearsing a bad behavior too for so. sure also an indication that your dog needs to be wearing a house line yeah you know you're going to be having anytime a dog's in training and you're not 100 sure that they're going to make great choices they're going to be dragging around a house line in the house and i see that uh barb mentions you keep referring to a leash on but uh but i've asked what to do when the dog bites on his leash he, she now thinks this it's a toy super common we have uh we have several videos that talk about what to do when your dog bites <laughs> on their house line uh in short basically especially for any of you that are working on this uh, and need a house line on your dog you're going to take it away from them you Anytime they're out of their, their kennel or crate, wherever you're, uh, wherever they sleep or stay, um, and they're out and around, they have the house line on. And you've got eyes on them because you're not going to give them an opportunity to make the wrong choices. When they start to chew on that leash, you can mark it with your voice. You'll step in and take it out of their mouth. And then you might guide them around and get them to do something for you. Maybe it's a lie on your bed. Maybe it's a sit. Just do something. Work for me a little bit. Then you're going to give them something else to chew on, sort of, get, you know, redirect them to something that it's okay to chew on. Now, this might happen after the first time. Maybe it have to, happens after the 31st time. Doesn't really matter. As long as you're consistent, that house line over time will become less and less of a toy. But it's really natural, and I don't want you to feel like, oh, my dog's really different um, when that happens. Really common. They're basically dragging around a tug toy. So you get, need to give them the right information. But boy, oh boy, does it make a difference in your training when you have great timing, when you can like interrupt a, 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 um, an, an annoying behavior from six feet away or five feet away. Um, it, it's really a useful tool uh, specifically when it comes to jumping up. Let's breeze over quickly the counters thing. Something we'll do is we'll actually reinforce the dog. Again, we have uh, a video like a... Um, long form video or video on demand of this um, that talks about uh, uh, stopping your dog from jumping up on the counter. The secret weapon for, and I love this, is uh, processed cheese. So what does processed cheese have to do with dog training? We're often <laughs> gonna work in these exercises. There's no way you can stop your dog from jumping up on the counter if you're not there. So number one, management. I'm not gonna let my dog in an area where they can make this mistake or be rewarded by jumping on the counter unless I am supervising them. Then we'll do something like bring them up to whatever the counter is that they love to jump up on and we might reward them uh, in a sit at our side or reward them for like checking it out and then coming back to us. It's going to be a bit of a process. We're going to be just like the jumping up on people. We're going to be showing them that it's valuable to keep your butt on the floor, to not be jumping up. And 
just for just for being there. Then we might introduce a bit of a challenge. We'll use like a slice of cheese because you know, like it's like flexy and sticky and gross. It per hangs perfectly over the edge of a counter. So you'll work at a distance. Remember the training target we just talked about. You'll work at a distance where your dog can be successful and then you'll start to reduce that distance, slowly making your way in. And you're gonna start to notice your dog's less interested in what they might be able to get over there and what's way more valuable because they're guaranteed to get something when they remain right here. Now, that doesn't mean that th the problem's solved. This is, it's a work in progress. So you're gonna do things like, you know, leave your dog for a very short amount of time when you can't supervise them as they get great at this. So if you think they're not going to jump up, but I wouldn't, um, you don't need me in a rush to leave them alone that's either. That's right. I know. So, yeah. so many people <laughs> think that, yeah, for sure. Just manage them. Yeah. X pen crate, whatever. Yeah. Um, don't, don't let them jump up on there because I'll tell you if they get the Turkey boy, it's hard to go back because yeah. it's so valuable to get up on the counter. Maybe it's a loaf of bread and maybe they're a cat. Or a chicken skewer, skewer or something right. that's a that's bit more dangerous. dangerous like for sure. With the for amount sure. of dogs that we get in our school and the amount of people and the stories, like you do not underestimate what your dog will try to jump up and steal from the counter. If you think, oh my gosh, they would never try to eat that or whatever, think again. <laughs> you have to be really, uh, really aware. Um, I wanted to say that um, you know, we talked about with jumping up on people, I said, like, don't wait till you somebody randomly walks up and you have to work through this and you're not ready. So you need to like set it up and practice it. We recommend the ex exact same thing with the counter surfing. Um, you know, you, like uh, Ken said, get the cheese out, get put the distractions up on the on the counter, kind of encourage the dog to think about jumping when you are right there, literally waiting for it to happen. So your timing can be epic it can be so perfect because it's harder to fix something when you're multitasking you're helping the kids with homework and you're yeah, somebody's exactly. come to the door and like you got something on the stove and it's like chaos in there and then your dog's like huh everybody's busy right now this is perfect for me just to grab you know get up and steal this no one's watching me um that's not a good time so you're going to manage well and then you're going to set your dog up so that you are ready to work through it with great timing and that is going to fix your problem way faster than just working on it on the random times that it comes up. Uh, Caroline Six, is this a skill I should be starting with my 13 week old puppy or is it too advanced? Well, uh, so I'm not sure exactly what skill you're talking about. I'm I assuming- I think probably jumping up. So this uh, 13 week old puppy would be part of our puppy essentials program. Um, and this skill specifically, we're not going to teach. Some variations in building some mm -hmm. foundational steps of this activity so that they don't even choose to jump up on the counter yeah. later on is what we're going to focus on when the dog's that age. But um, maybe. You yeah. Well, what I would them. say when I have young puppies, um, also I'm trying to learn about the puppy first, because if you have a soft puppy and then you don't really know about them yet and they go to jump up on somebody and you yeah. get after them for that, you know, when, before you really even know. So you want to be careful. So what I always do with puppies is I focus only on uh, prevention. So for example, right from an early age, if people want to say hello to my puppy, I'll I'll take some treats and lure them into a sit. I'll have other people lure them into a sit and feed them there. So I start to condition the puppy through positive reinforcement only um, what they should be doing in order to greet someone. So I'm kind of planting the seed. And then as they get a little bit older, I might start to be a little bit more strict about their behavior. But when you have a puppy that young, keep it really simple and very positive. Um, do you have a dog? Oh, huge... Uh Happy anniversary <gasps> yes. to the founders of McCann Professional Dog Trainers. My parents. Marty and Deb McCann. Yes, they are celebrating their 44th wedding anniversary today. They are watching. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Uh, 40 years in business, 40 years of having kids. I'm not going to say which kids that it, they are. And 44 years of marriage. It's pretty good. Yeah, pretty exciting. Yep. Do you have a dog that you put music on for? Uh we do. Um, one we of our used dogs it this morning. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> one of our dogs is pretty sound sensitive, and um, you know we'll use music and fill the environment with that music to keep her a little bit more relaxed. It's actually something we discovered when we were on a trip for a dog agility competition. So during that trip, we recognized that there's not enough, there's nothing out there that's 
music that's actually for dogs. So we worked with some digital uh, composers and we made it. McCann Dogs Music. At the end of tonight's live stream, when I hit the stop streaming button, you guys are going to go directly to the McCann Dogs Music YouTube channel. You can actually check us out on uh, Apple, on Spotify, all the music places. But if you use music for your dog to listen to, to fill that, because we know how valuable it is for so many dog owners, then uh, make sure you check out McCann Dogs Music. Maybe we'll see you if you're joining the programs. Maybe we'll see you on Monday for a coaching call. Maybe not. Either way, a huge thank you to our moderators. And thank you for joining us here tonight. I want you to notice that after an hour of dog training, Kale doesn't have the sniffles anymore. That's not true. (laughs) She she almost didn't have the sniffles anymore. I'm a bit better, though. (laughs) And we're happy that you're better. With all of the teaching, all of the training, all of the things that we've talked about tonight, the rest, my friends, well, that is up to you. 